Welcome to Context TV from the World Social Forum in Dakar, Senegal. We are here at the University Library. Our guest is Pat Mooney with the Action Group on Erosion, Technology and Concentration, Canada. He has been extensively researching and campaigning on issues of the danger of emerging technologies such as geoengineering, that is technical manipulation of earth systems and nanotechnology. He's author of the book Next Bang, which has come out recently in uh, German and there will be also an English edition soon. Welcome to Context TV, Pat Mooney. Thank you for having me. Since the World Summit in Rio in 1992, many international conferences on climate change and environmental issues have been taking place. What is your assessment of that process and its outcomes until now? Yeah, we've been saying that <clears throat> we really shouldn't be talking about Rio plus 20. We should be talking about Stockholm plus 40. Uh, because the first major environmental conference was held in, in 1972 in Stockholm. And, and then Rio was really 20 years after that. Um, and in that context, I think the outcome is quite clear. It, uh, um, it, we have experienced a kind of a Stockholm syndrome in civil society, where all of us have fallen in love with our captors. We've fallen in love with the UN system, and we've fallen in love with UN negotiations, and with being the camp followers, in a sense, to uh, everything that happens in terms of international environmental debate uh, in the United Nations. So I think the outcome has been pretty bad. I think we in civil society have performed badly, and I think that the governments have performed terribly over the last uh, 40, 40 Four, four decades. Why have we failed? Governments haven't taken the issue seriously. I mean, governments have, have uh, were captured immediately after the, the Stockholm conference in '72. They were they were captured by uh, neoliberalism and and the the big push towards uh, big economic growth and the big push toward uh, uh, technological fixes to solving our problems. So we now find uh, a world full of governments that say we don't really need to do social policy. We don't need to think about stuff anymore. All we got to do is let industry uh, uh, tell us what the technological fix will be that will get us out of the food crisis, out of the fuel crisis, out of climate change, out of the financial crisis. They'll take care of it for us. We just have to give them the tools or the, 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 the regulatory mechanisms they need to solve the problem. And that attitude is hopeless. I mean, that, that attitude has led to uh, last year us losing 2% of our plant diversity on the planet, 4%, 5%, of me, of our, of our livestock diversity on the planet, uh, losing uh, 26 different languages last year, uh, cultural diversity being lost at an enormous rate, and, and yet they carry on and think that they can just, again, have a, a technological solution to everything. Pet Mooney, you have been warning for a long time about the possible dangers of technocratic green economy proposals and geoengineering to combat climate change and other environmental problems. What technologies do we mean exactly and what are the dangers in your view? I should be clear that I mean I love science and technology. I think it's all great, uh, not all great. I mean, I, but I mean I'm fascinated by it, and I mean I want to encourage more science and so on. But what being proposed isn't a solution. What's being proposed is that instead of dealing with peak oil as a reality, instead of uh, dealing with the, f the fact that we overconsume in terms of energy resources and cannot continue that, instead we're being told, don't worry, we've got nanotechnology that will massively make it easier for us to harness the energy of the sun and wind power and so on and and will let us massively reduce our energy requirements for 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 machinery and so on that that's their that's the answer and in the case of also in the case of the food crisis and the idea of biofuels we're being in plastics and so on we're being told uh, don't worry about that we'll develop a second or a third generation of biotechnology which is called synthetic biology and that will solve the problem so relaxed don't worry be happy it'll be done What does synthetic biotechnology mean? Well, it's sort of a, a, a biotech on steroids, I guess. Uh, it, it's, um, the idea is that with, with biotech, what you do is you move a gene from one species to another. Uh, very simple, uh, very messy, frankly, in the end of the day, it doesn't really work. But, but that's what you do. With, with synthetic biology, you build your own DNA. You start from the bottom up, constructing the DNA to exactly the design that you want to have. So you build the base pairs. 
and you decide exactly how you want to make the, the organism to do things. And the theory is, and it gets entirely a theory, is that with synthetic biology then, building your own DNA, you can create microorganisms the world has never seen before that can gobble up the cellulosic fiber in, in the forest and to convert that into sugars that can be converted into plastics or food or fuels or furniture or whatever you want. So you don't need to worry about what you build finally. You just need to take biomass, control the biomass, and, and convert that biomass with, with these new microbes into whatever end product you want. What is the danger of this technology? Well, it's, incre it's incredibly powerful and, and uh, it's incredibly dangerous. It, it may not work. It probably won't work particularly well. It may work kind of half, you know, well. It may work some of the time. But uh, we think it's, it's, it's creating life forms that we've never seen before. It, it makes, again, uh, standard sort of GMOs look like child's play. Uh, They're, they're building things we can't even imagine. Last year, for example, uh, scientists at Cambridge University discovered that they could trick, using synthetic biology, they could convince the cell to not build 20 amino acids, which is the basis for all living materials, but to build 276 amino acids. Can you imagine, I mean, the difference between life made of 20 amino acids and life made of 276 amino acids means that you could have more biological diversity in a test tube than you would have in all of the Amazon. And, and unnatural biological diversity the world hasn't seen before. Well, what do we do with those life forms? Uh, what if they're released into the environment? Everything always escapes from the lab into the environment. What happens when this, when this does? Last year we also learned through synthetic biology that it's possible not just to build a life form, but to actually build, for the first time ever, an artificial self-replicating life form, when it will keep on multiplying and mutating afterwards. And again, that's, that's uh, the power of that technology as sloppy as it may turn out to be, or as ineffective as it may sometimes turn out to be, is, is uh, something we've never seen before on the planet. Which corporations are involved in these sort of technologies? The same wonderful folks that brought us climate change in the first place, who geoengineered our planet into the, the crisis that we're in. It's BP, and it's Exxon Mobil, and it's Shell, and it's uh, uh, the big plastics chemical companies, DuPont and Monsanto and BASF, are all the ones that are taking the lead in this research. And it's our governments. I mean, it's, it's um, huge investments coming from the U.S. Department of Energy, huge investments coming from the U.S. Department of Agriculture, from the British government and so on as well. What is meant by the term geoengineering? It's, a, it's an interesting term, isn't it? Because it, to me, when we thought of, we saw what was being proposed, which is to restructure the, the surface of the ocean or to restructure the stratosphere to block sunlight, for example, we thought, my God, that's geoengineering. And, and we thought of that as the most derogatory term we could think of geoengineering the planet. And yet we find that the scientists who are doing this work, they call it geoengineering as well. They think it's a good thing. We think it's a terrible thing. Uh, they, they say, of course, that, that um, the proof of principle that human beings can geoengineer the planet is before us. We have climate change. Uh, industry, again, the BPs and the DuPonts of the world have geoengineered the planet into this crisis. So they're saying, don't worry, folks, we'll take care of it. We'll geoengineer you out of the crisis again. And that the two broad tools they're talking about to do that are one, that you can again change the biological surface of the ocean so that it will absorb greenhouse gases and then sink them to the bottom of the ocean, get them out of the way. Or you can block sunlight through a variety of different methods, blasting sulfates into the stratosphere, for example. You can block the sunlight so you can lower temperatures and probably at the same time lower methane emissions as well in the Arctic areas, which would again buy time for us to. to, to perhaps have other solutions down the road. Uh, the danger of that is uh, probably obvious, but, but the, the most amazing thing to me is that, that uh, we don't know enough about our climate. We don't know about how planetary systems work. To be able to suggest that we can play God with, with uh, the oceans or play God with the sky and, and, and do it in a way which is any remote way, any remote way safe, any remote way equitable to the poor of the world is just silly. It will not happen.